Smith, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Senator Griffin. On behalf of the United Food and Commercial Workers, I'd like to say, um, like to say thank you to the Standing Committee for the opportunity to share our uh, perspective today, and also for the work of the committee on this important subject. Before I put forward some of our thoughts, perhaps it, it might be good to say a few words about who we are. The UFCW is the voice of Canada's food workers. We are one of Canada's largest unions, and we are proud and privileged to represent more than a quarter of a million hardworking people across Canada. About 80% of our membership works in food-related sectors, and as we like to say, you can find UFCW members everywhere in the food chain, from field to fork. Within our membership, we are very proud to include more than 40,000 food processing workers who have a direct role in making the value-added sector possible. And the main point we are looking to share with you today is, of course, Canada's food manufacturing industry is a key part of the food chain. And the thought of further expanding that sector is certainly music to our ears. But the whole goal is premised upon the existence of a robust primary agricultural sector. And while there is no doubt that Canada is a leading source in terms of food production, and that we clearly have an opportunity to expand our role as one of the world's great food leaders, we are here to say that realizing that goal will depend upon a stable, a stable labor supply. Right now in Canada's agri-food system, Finding labor to meet production needs is a growing challenge for producers and processors. In fact, some are saying that it's reached a crisis point. Many employer groups will say that's because egg work is hard, and they're certainly right about that. They'll also say it's because it's dirty, and if you've ever been to a mushroom facility or spent some time in a field, you certainly couldn't argue with that either. But they'll also say that it's because of these things that Canadians don't want to do the jobs, and that's where we as the UFCW don't necessarily agree. Construction is hard work, and many of the trades are quote-unquote dirty work, but they don't seem to face the same challenges in terms of attracting Canadians to do the work. There's certainly no question that there are far more TFWs in the ag sector versus the construction industry. We believe that when it comes to making agri-food a desired destination for Canadian workers, there are a number of major issues blocking our sector or setting us back. The first is the continued exclusion of ag workers from the Labor Relations Act in Ontario. The fact that workers are effectively barred from joining the union in the heartland of Canada's ag sector is something that shocks Canadians when they find out. And in recent years, this fact has also led to our country being shamed by the international community, especially after the ILO of the UN looked at the situation and found Canada guilty of violating international labour law. Who wants to work in a dirty, dangerous, hard sector where you don't have the same rights as everybody else? Who wants to work in a sector where people didn't have basic health and safety rights in Ontario until 2006? The answer is, as we know, not very many Canadians. So we now have a situation where more than 35,000 migrants and growing come to Canada every year to fill the growing labour gap in the agri-food sector. It's important to note that most of these migrants come from developing countries where corruption is often rampant, where the rule of law and the notion of human rights are not nearly as developed as they are here in Canada. And what we get as a result is one of the most vulnerable worker populations in the country a worker population that has no idea what their rights are, and even if they did, would have good reason not to demand them. Instead, what we see are abused workers go underground, and as a result, we are assisting a growing number of workers who are being declared victims of human trafficking. And a big part of the reason is that migrant workers come to Canada uh, with closed work permits, so it's purely luck of the draw. And those who end up with an irresponsible employer feel like they only have one of two options. They can grin and bear it, or they can go underground as part of the shadow economy. And when they do the latter, they become completely vulnerable and profoundly susceptible to exploitation. As Canada's voice of food workers, we once again thank the committee for shouldering this, this very important work. And once again, we are strongly in favor of a policy that, advan that advances value-added production in Canada 
while fully respecting the rights of workers, of course. And we reiterate that a strong value-added sector is based on a strong foundation of primary agriculture. And the foundation of that foundation is a stable and productive labor force. And to help achieve that, we call on the federal government to urge the provinces to ensure that collective bargaining rights are extended to all workers in the food chain. We also recommend the extension of the provincial nominee program or something similar to ensure that more food system workers who come here as TFWs have a realistic path to citizenship. And we have many examples where this model has been very successful for the, for the meat sector and can be just as beneficial for the ag industry. And in the meantime, the TFWP must urgently introduce some badly needed safeguards to prevent the abuse and exploitation of migrant food workers. And we strongly urge this committee to join the UFCW's call for open work permits a mandatory training as part of that program, which would involve all migrants receiving government-approved training on human rights, health and safety, and other core subjects. Thank you, and I, I should also add that the UFCW has been uh, very heavily involved in the primary agriculture review of the Temporary Foreign Workers Program, and I, I thought the members of the committee as such might be interested in uh, having a copy of our submission for that process, so I've, I've left some with, with the clerk. Uh, but beyond that, that would uh, conclude my introductory uh, remarks, and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we'll move to Portia McDonald Dewhurst. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this study. It's an important study. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Agricultural Human Resource Council, and our presentation will focus on worker shortages, temporary foreign workers, and immigration in support of industry growth uh, for a sector that has such great potential. We've prepared a, a presentation deck to coincide with our presentation, so I do uh, invite you to take a look at that and follow along some pictures to, to be enjoyed while we're, we're sharing our thoughts. Um, in Canada, we have the advantage of enjoying the benefits of an abundant, healthy, and safe, affordable food system, one that uh, feeds 36 million Canadians, and as the fifth largest exporter, feeds a multitude of people around the world. It's an important industry to our country, not only for nourishment, but also because the agri-food industry, our value chain, employs 2.3 million Canadians and is a leading driver of our provincial and national economies. Domestic and global demand for the Canada brand is high. We currently export most of what we produce in terms of beef, pork, soybeans, wheat, canola, and pulses. There are great expectations for growth of this industry as documented by the Conference Board of Canada, the Advisory Council on Economic Growth, uh, the Economic Strategy Table for Agri-Food, and provincial and federal budgets. In fact, our government specifically expects to increase export targets for agri-food by $19 billion in the next 10 years. However, the agri-food industry relies on people farm and food businesses and their workers to plant, grow, harvest, prepare and package its products. Unfortunately, the business of farm and food production is struggling to find enough workers and its future is in jeopardy. Our research clarifies that in 2004, the agriculture industry was 30,000 workers short, and 10 years later, that dub figure doubled to 59,000 workers with clear expectations that it would double again in the next 10 years to 114,000 workers by 2025. On-farm job vacancies are exceptionally high at 7% when the national average is only 2.8. Vacancies on mushroom farms are even worse at 9.7% as are vacancies in meat processing plants with nearly 1,700 butcher stations sitting empty across Canada today. These vacancies are costing the farming industry $1.5 billion a year and exist despite extensive efforts by business owners to recruit and attract workers. 
What's particularly troubling is the inability to fill job vacancies is resulting in delays or cancellation to expansion plans by large and growth-oriented um, agri-food business operations. Our research findings are documented in national, provincial, and commodity-specific reports that you can access. They're free to access through our website. The findings are clear that labor shortages are being experienced across all commodities, all regions of Canada, all sizes of operations, <coughs> and for positions that are both year-round and seasonal, despite extensive time and effort spent on recruiting workers. Although the industry brings in approximately 45,000 temporary farm workers each year, 35,000 through the SOP stream and 10,000 through the ag stream, this represents 12, only 12% 12 of the agri-workforce and it secures so many Canadian jobs. The industry is still in critical shortage and that shortage worsens each year. CAR conducts labour market intelligence to track the growing labour shortage and its impacts with new research underway and we should have those findings in, uh, the, by mid-2019. So following years of extensive research and consultation with industry, CARC has clarified that the inability to fill job vacancies is the top business risk identified by Canada's farmers and food producers. Without being able to fill key positions, farm businesses are struggling as the shortages are impacting production, sales, competitiveness, and certainly future growth. Farmers are choosing to forego planting all of their fields and they're avoiding labor-intensive crops. Farmers and food producers are forced to throw food out because they do not have enough workers to harvest and process their products. They are unable to fill orders, unable to do the value-add processing, sending raw products and opportunities to the U.S. and other countries. They're not able to take advantage of opportunities in new markets. They are foregoing expansion plans, choosing to retire early, and opting out of the agri-food business altogether. Right now, sustainability is at risk, and achieving any level of industry growth is also critically at risk. These risks need to be acknowledged and mitigated in an intentional and strategic way. And I'm going to um, invite Mary to complete Kark's presentation as the chair of our, um, our Canadian Agricultural Human Resource Council. Uh, Mary is also uh, the co-owner of several agri-food businesses in PEI. She serves as the director on many associations in the agriculture and agri-food industry and is a member of Canada's National Labour Task Force for the agriculture and agri-food industry. Thank you and thank you for the invitation. It's uh, an honour to be here today to speak to you. I do have a bit of a cold, so I, I apologize if I'm coughing. Um, addressing labor challenges for the agri-food sector needs to be a foundational objective for the Government of Canada. Growing and securing the agri-workforce underpins the priorities of increasing export targets and growing Canada's agri-food industry. <clears throat> These priori priorities cannot be fully realized without addressing existing and worsening agri-force shortages. A number of industry leaders have come forward through Canada's Value Change Roundtables to create Canada's National Labour Task Force. Together with the support of CARC, they have researched and documented a Canadian Agriculture and Agri-Food Workforce Action Plan that is supported by over 85, industry, uh, 85 leading industry organizations, municipalities and Value Chain Roundtables. The Workforce Action Plan stresses the importance of continued LMI research conducted by CARC to track workforce requirements and includes two overarching priorities to ensure the industry remains viable and competitive. The first is to increase the labour pool for domestic and international workers and the second is to improve the knowledge and skills of workers. Canada's Agri-Food Economic Strategy Table prepared recommendations that align with the Workforce Action Plan including support the sector's capacity to plan for, train, attract and retain human capital, modernize Canada's immigration and temporary foreign working programs and support greater participation of underrepresented groups. In addition, they recommend a skills and talent collaboration hub like CARC to support success. 
Through these recommendations and plans, industry leaders have been clear about the need to address workforce issues. This means clarifying the exciting work opportunities the industry has to offer to Canadian job seekers, improving diversity of the sector, supporting employee employers with best practice staff management tools, ensuring appropriate access to workers when Canadians can't be found, and improving immigration options. If we want this industry to thrive, we need to grow the agri workforce and ensure it is filled to the capacity with the brightest people that are willing to push innovation and success. The industry's diversity success stories should be highlighted and there's uh, some slides in, I think we're on about slide 16 for people trying to follow along. Um, and we have uh, pictures of a, a couple of, um, of folks, a meat, pro a meat processor in Alberta that conducts extensive recruitment strategies to hire Canadians including ongoing advertising and work with settlement agencies as well as providing important support for temporary foreign workers. Their workforce integrates Canadians, new immigrants and temporary foreign workers that originate from 100 different countries and speak 66 languages. It is important that we recognize, value and celebrate the international guest worker who come to Canada to help the industry thrive. They are a key component of our agri-food success and have been for over 50 years. Many international workers return year after year, sometimes for more than 30 years through the Seasonal Agriculture Worker Program, supporting Canadian food process producers and using their earnings to support their families in their home countries. A key priority to ensure that the agri-food industry has access to international workers when Canadians are unavailable. The agri-food economic strategy table acknowledges that the sector is experiencing restricted access to foreign workers and recommends program modernization. CARC's research has documented the increasing difficulty agri-food employers face assessing the workers they need accessing the workers they need in a timely manner through the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. Particularly troubling are the increasing reports of application delays and refusals for businesses that state they are seeking workers in order to grow their operations. A new service delivery working group has been initiated recently to tackle short-term issues, but more needs to be done in this critical area to improve the ability of businesses to fill vacancies without delay in order to avoid losses and growth restrictions. Securing pathways to permanent residency for those temporary foreign workers who are employed in year-round jobs and are interested in immigration is also key. Retaining Canadian trained talent makes sense when workers can't be found. However, those pathways to immigration are currently limited for low-skilled workers. These limited pathways persist even though the industry is experiencing high vacancies, offers competitive wages, and can show successful retention for these workers. Working with the Canadian Meat Council and Mushrooms Canada, CARC has conducted extensive research about butcher and farm worker jobs in terms of vacancies and immigration needs for temporary foreign workers. This this research shows that butcher, butchers stay at meat processing plants for an average of 10 years and mushroom farm workers stay on average 11 years. Currently there are 900 temporary farm worker butchers like Ronald, this is the picture I'm talking about, from Breslau, Ontario, and I apologize I'm not from Ontario, I think that's how we say it, is it Senator Black? Breslau, thank you. And 700 farm workers like Eric from Ashburn, Ontario, I think I got that one right, who would like to stay in their positions and are looking for immigration options. Unfortunately, they don't qualify for federal or most provincial programs other than Manitoba, given that Canada prioritizes high skill workers. Ronald and Eric are workers with agri-food experience and skills seeking a way to stay in rural Canada where they are valued by their communities and their employers. Although these hardworking farm and food employees are the foundation of what Canada was built on and their positions will go unfilled if they leave, there is not a clear immigration option for them. This situation is extremely frustrating for workers. It is also extremely frustrating for agri-food business owners because it exposes them to losses, limits their success and restricts their growth. Time is of the essence for supporting farm and food businesses to thrive. 
with annual lost revenues in the billions and a future outlook that predicts a doubling of workforce shortages. Continued research and focus on these issues is needed. The research clearly indicates that improving competitiveness and expanding the industry will require focused attention on worker shortages, temporary farm workers and immigration. The Canadian Agriculture Human Resource Council facilitates collaboration between government and industry stakeholders and continues to provide up-to-date labour market intelligence and support for workforce issues. Further research and collaboration activities are key to tackling the extensive job vacancies within the industry and the stress those empty positions have on businesses. Strategic investment and coordinated action are needed to enable the industry's sustainability and are essential if the agri-food system is expected to achieve any growth. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have one question before we go for other questions. Um, you stated that unfilled vacancies cost the industry $1.5 billion. Over what period is, is this, and what is the $1.5 billion? Is it over time, paid to other workers? Is it a lost opportunity? What exactly is it? So the, the $1.5 billion was, uh, it was the first year that I think it had been measured. Uh, and it was in 2014, so it has escalated since 2014. I understand the $1.5 billion is strictly primary production losses, and beyond that, due to, due, vacancies. due to vacancies. So that would be everything you've mentioned, Senator, as far as uh, probably um, un the inability to plant, maintain, harvest, pack, ship, all of the... So it's all, all the lost opportunity plus probably paying some over time. It's lost sales. Okay. That's a lot of money. And that was in 2014. For one year only. And when you look at that trajectory of where we're going with the vacancies, considering that gap is increasing, we have more vacancies, that 2014 figure could definitely be adjusted up. Okay. Great. Okay, to give everybody else a chance to ask questions, <laughs> here's the list. Uh, Senators Malte, Atula Jean, Mercer, Wu, O.O., Dejeuner, Black, and Gagne. Senator Malte. Merci. <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have two brief questions for Mr. Johnstone. Sir, you represent a major union, you have workers across the country. Have you conducted any studies as to why there is such a lack of such a lack of labor in your sector today? Our studies would be anecdotal for the most part, but the, there are many anecdotes. Um, you know, I, I just, I just, I think that uh, when we talk about this this question, I think it would be beneficial for the committee to. The reality is, when you look at agri-food and you're looking at primary through to secondary processing, especially when you're comparing um, the field with the meat sector, we've heard the meat sector, it's really a tale of two cities. I have to be honest with you. You have in the meat sector, you've got. Um, an industry that has a long history um, in all the major markets, in Quebec, in uh, Manitoba, in Ontario, certainly, um, a long history of very high union density in those sectors. And um, as a result of that, we've, we have very mature developed relationships with employers. And through that, um, we've actually partnered with some of the largest meat processors in the country to, to tackle some of these issues, especially we've heard about having a fair pathway to citizenship for, um, for migrants. And in, that's a reality in the meat sector. Um, through UFCW contracts um, with all of the major uh, processors, we've been able to negotiate language that um, includes the employer becoming a nominee <coughs> through the provincial nominee program, which has resulted in hundreds, if not thousands, of TFWs now becoming Canadian citizens. Um, <coughs> and, it's a completely different um, experience on the, ag, on the ag side where they don't have the right to join the union. 
that having been said, that having been said, um, we have a number of centers for agriculture workers who come in and tell us our issues. So this would be the nature of, of the anecdotes that, that we hear. Um, and it's a totally different experience on the, on the meat side because, because we, rep them, we represent them through um, the collective bargaining process. Well, it's quite clear that the potential growth of agricultural workers and workers in the processing business, um, nobody could have foreseen the, uh, the shortage that we have today. If a farmer has no labor, well, there's no product to pass on to processors. And if processors don't have any labor, um, it's a vicious circle, if you will. Another brief question on the choices these temporary foreign workers make. Everyone has said that we're missing butchers and we're missing workers in other sectors of the processing industry. When a company needs 50 workers, for instance, can this company under the current system of training workers, can a, an employer say, well, I need three butchers, I need three um, fork operators or other unskilled workers, can the company itself pinpoint its needs when it puts in an application for foreign workers? Well, I think that when you're, I'm sure you'd want to chime in here, but I think that when you're talking about the meat sector, um, it's certainly not a couple here, a couple there. They're hiring on, on mass and bringing in large numbers of uh, temporary foreign workers in, in two-year arrangements. So um, in terms of pinpointing the particular skills, I think that their, their top priority is to have people with meat cutting experience. And I know that some major processors will only take uh, some, some migrants who have that experience. But, um, I, and my colleagues here could certainly speak to this, but I think the demand for labor is, is so great that um, they're not hard and fast with a lot of that, that prior experience. But you're usually talking about significant numbers that are being brought in um, at a time, right? Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, yeah, another, do you have any comment on that? And then we'll move on. Sure. People are only gonna get two questions each on the first round, by the way. I, I would agree that um, that the, the labor shortage is so great that often the, the need is for uh, um, a, a number of different workers that's included in the LMIA, the application that's put forward for position, but it is specific, position specific. So the employer indicates the type of worker that they're looking for. Okay. Thank you, uh, Senator Atul Jain. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, for all of you, for being here. So I have a really, uh, might be a really simple question. I, so we've heard about the shortages in the food, uh, you know, um, uh, industry, food processing. Um, and my thing is, how do we get young people to be attracted to these, I mean, Appealing, appealing, or dare I say, how do we make it more sexy for young people? <laughs> you know that this is, this is a, like I haven't spoken to any young person who says, yeah, I'm going into you know, uh, food processing or the agriculture business. So how, do, what can we do to attract more young Canadians to this profession? Well, I think there's there's two different ways of looking. I think when you're looking about uh, the the domestic workforce. Uh, let's face it. The the sector has a has a perception issues. It has it, it's it's. I think young people they look at the sector and they don't exactly see a very uh, glamorous place to go to work. And there's and as I stated in my opening comments, there's some, there's some legitimacy associated with that. Um, it is not. There are some excellent employers in the agri food sector. There are some tremendous employers. Many many very responsible employers. But there's some bad apples. And uh, they've done a real number, I think, in terms of uh, the perception of the program. With, uh, and I know my colleagues have done a lot of research on this, when we're looking at temporary foreign workers, one of the, the, common, the common themes in terms of, um, of once people are, are lucky enough to establish permanent residency that they stay at these, these locations, let's face it, a lot of them are in, in rural areas, is this notion of community. So 
the locations that have been successful in um, having low reten or high retention rates and low turnover rates are ones that have established a sense of community. We've certainly seen that um, where the UFCW represents members in uh, Brooks, Alberta, for instance. Um, there's a very there's some very strong ethnic communities there. Um, and the union, quite frankly, um, has played a significant role in helping develop the sense of community. I know in Brandon, Manitoba, where there are a lot of Ukrainian temporary foreign workers come in. I talked to one of our members, and he said, when I first came here, all I had was my church and my union. And through the support of the union, he was able to get permanent residency, and his connections to the community grew over time, his network grew over time, and uh, he has citizenship. Now he can work anywhere, but he stayed there. So community is a major factor, and whatever um, we as stakeholders can do, government, employers, the trade union movement to develop that sense of community, I think is really the, the secret recipe in terms of transitioning temporary foreign workers, hopefully to a real pathway to citizenship, and from there to, to something that's stable in terms of the workforce for, for these plants across, across Canada. Thank you. Do you have a comment on that? I'll say to the panelists, remember, these people are only getting two questions each, maximum five minutes, so that okay. includes you. I'll, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll be brief. Uh, you mentioned how do we get young people into the industry. Um, and it's important that we recognize that it's not just young people we have to convince, although we do have to convince young people. We also, there aren't enough young people. Um, we also need to think about convincing all Canadian workforce, uh, the whole workforce, to consider work in this industry. It's a great place to work. Um, it appeals to a lot of people. It's an exciting place to work. There are entrepreneurial opportunities. It's a tech industry. It's a growing industry. Um, the world is only getting bigger and hungrier. Okay. Thank you. Senator Mercer, your two questions, please, in the first round. I'm trying to get creative and, and, and put a couple of the questions together so I get more than two questions. You, you know Spe me. Speeches <coughs> count as one uh, question. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I guess um, one of the things that uh, some people don't know is uh, some basic facts, and Canadians don't know, so we'll maybe we'll take a, an opportunity to, to tell them in your answers. What are the, uh, what would the average salaries and benefits uh, uh, be for uh, temporary foreign workers and uh, you know, other benefits that that they would have. We visited uh, uh, some farms, particularly in in uh, British Columbia, where the, the, the farmers have, have had to build uh, special housing uh, for for the temporary foreign workers. Provide obviously uh, some, some some recreation uh, for them as well. Uh, is is there a simple answer to that question? Because I know that Mr. Johnson. Uh, your union would, would probably tell me the average salary is, is, is a lot higher than someone uh, who's, who's working in, in harvesting uh, fruit or vegetables. On, on the egg side, uh, well, on the meat side, um, the, the wages vary, but um, they can go anywhere from $15 up to well, well and over $30 an hour. Depends on where they are in the wage progression, and there's a con there's an element of consistency in the meat sector because these workers are covered by a collective agreement. When you go to the the farms that you reference, Senator, it's a whole different ball of wax. And um, again, there are very good employers, but there are some that are not good. And I I would say, and I I know this for a fact because we've assisted countless uh, migrant farm workers on this issue. Many of them are just getting paid whatever they're getting paid, whether that's the employment standard or not. Irresponsible employers know that these workers are vulnerable. They know that they do not have um, the same rights as most other people. They know that they have a closed work permit, so they are tied to that single employer. And if um, the farmer, an irresponsible employer, is not <coughs> happy with this worker for whatever reason is, they can be sent home with a stroke of a pen. So, Senator, to be honest with you, it varies greatly when you look at primary agriculture versus uh, some of the secondary processing where there's a higher level of, of, of unit density. Ms. Robertson? Uh, 
CARC has done some, um, some wage survey work on this, and we can tell you with certainty that um, in the mushroom farming business, uh, entry level to experienced harvester ranges from minimum wage up to about $29 an hour. When you get into supervisory positions, it ranges from $35 to $80,000. Um, $80, sorry, $35,000 to $80,000 $80, a year. Uh, and these are these are wages that are competitive. Um, we would like to be able to conduct further research and do more extensive <coughs> wage surveys, and, and we hope that um, some of uh, the projects we have uh, made application for get approval, and we're able to do that to give you factual information on where the wages truly are. Okay. The second question, uh, the chair, is, is to Mr. Johnson. Uh, I, I think many of us are shocked that the. In Ontario, the temporary foreign workers are excluded from the Ontario Labor Relations Act. And uh, I guess my question is of the union: is uh, why aren't? Why, and, and I know that the time, the opportunity right now is probably a little tougher than it was a few months ago. Uh, but in, in Ontario, uh, is why aren't we, why aren't you telling Ontarians that this is this is an issue? And this is it's not only an issue from from a fairness point of view. It's an issue from a safety point of view. It's an issue from a uh, from a growth point of view for the for agriculture for agri food in in Ontario. I, does the union not have a responsibility to get out there and tell that message to Ontarians so that they can turn around and demand change for the people uh, from the people of Queens Park? You're preaching to the choir, and we've we've been telling Ontarians since uh, 1995 when uh, when the law was rolled back, um, and we've gone so far as to challenge that law many times to the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, and it's not just, Senator, it's not just um, migrant workers who are, I was, bo I was born in Sudbury, Ontario. I, if I worked in, in the ag, primary ag sector, I am not allowed to join, I am excluded from the Labor Relations Act. It just happens because of the, um, for a number of reasons that we've touched on, um, there are a huge number of migrants in the sector. Um, the Canadians, for a number of reasons, are it's not their first destination when they go to the labour market. As, as a result, employers have turned to the, to the temporary foreign workers program, but it's for, the, it's for the whole sector. And if you or I, Senator, wanted to go work at a farm in Leamington, Ontario, um, we would be excluded from the Ontario Labour Relations Act as well. And I'm, I'm with you 100%. I, more Ontarians need to do this. We're, we're doing what we can, but we certainly need all the allies we can get to get this word up because a lot of people don't know, and when they do know, they're quite shocked by, by that reality. Hopefully they're paying attention tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so. We're hearing about it in spades. Okay, Senator Wu. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, this is a study about value added, which is another way of saying we want to increase productivity in the sector. And productivity has been a huge problem in the Canadian economy in general, I presume also for the ag sector. Now, the relationship between labour supply and productivity is complex, but uh, there are many who believe that access to low-cost labour is a deterrent to productivity because it encourages uh, use of low labour rather than mechanisation and labour-saving devices, you know, automation, innovation, and so on. I understand, of course, that when it comes to harvesting primary production, Maybe there are limits to what mechanization can do, but I'd like you to talk a bit about what more can be done in mechanization, because in some senses we are shooting ourselves in the foot if we rely only on cheap labor and don't try to move up the value chain through productivity enhancing investments, and we don't want to create disincentives to industry for not making those investments by uh, providing them with an uh, endless pool of uh, cheap labour. So can you comment on that? Then I've got a related question. Um, I'll start off the comment, and then you can take it from there. So we conducted some research in 2014 on productivity in primary agriculture, and the Conference Board of Canada indicated that Canadian agriculture was a productivity star amongst uh, by comparing all other industry sectors. Within a five-year period, it was indicated that the industry had increased productivity per worker 45%. It's unheard of, and that is mainly due to um, mechanization and through innovative ways to address the labor shortage. 
What they also indicated was that trend was not something that could be stabilized over time. So, mm -hmm. so there needs to be more consideration for how best to address labor shortage in new and interesting and innovative ways. Is the productivity increase only at the production level or also up the value chain up processing value chain as, well? as well? Okay, mm -hmm. that's very helpful. My second question is, uh, is uh, related. Uh, having ample labor, whether through TFWs or immigration, is no guarantee that you'll develop value-added products. Uh, in some ways, it might just encourage you to stay with the current production line because you're comfortable, prices are high, and uh, markets are secure, and there's no need to develop value-added products. So I'm interested in your thinking on accessing uh, foreign labor, let's call it, not for the low end, not for the picking and the butchers and the, the mushroom farms and so on, but the best food scientists in the world, the best marketing experts in the world, the best supply chain value-added people in the world, people who come from other countries who are not just, you know, chopping meat, but who understand about markets in Asia or Africa or Latin America and who know how to innovate Canadian raw materials for markets in those countries. What are we doing in terms of diversity at the high end of your leadership in the agricultural sector as a way of increasing value added in the sector? Which <laughs> We know for certain that at the, the lower wage end, the, the vacancies are rampant. Right. Um, at the upper end, we've got, we do have quite a lot of expertise within our country. We don't hear of that need as much, um, and more needs to be done straight across the board. Uh, but with, with our lower wage, and, and I don't know if I would call it cheap labor, because um, producers are paying more for foreign worker labor than they're paying for Joe down the street. And, uh, and the, one of the, the big expenses that we don't realize for foreign workers, for primary producers, is if, if I need foreign workers on my farm, I'm probably going to have to begin the process of making the application anywhere from four to six months before I need them. Uh, and in that process, I'm going to have to invest in establishing housing. I'm going to have to put a lot of investment of my time and my resources into that without knowing for certain I'm going to get them. So the, the gap is most pronounced at the beginning of the process. And I would agree with you that more needs to be done straight across the board. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here. Uh, Canada has suspended farm owner category in self employed business immigration. What's your comment on this change? Sorry, Canada has suspended which, Senator? I'm sorry? The farm, farm owner category in self employed business immigration. Is it recently? No? No. Sure. All right. I put a question the other way. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, uh, we all know that, you know, temporary and seasonal worker is very important to Canadian economic growth. You know, government needs a revenue coming in. So do you get cooperation from all departments? You know, how difficult, how long does it take the process to bring one worker in? Because time costs money. It sure does cost money, and, and uh, there's a lot of money invested up front to begin the process. And uh, I can speak, um, a neighbor of mine um, has a, a value-add potato packing facility uh, just east of Charlottetown. Senator, you would know the Vanco operation. And uh, they employ about 130 people in their facility, and um, 34 of those are foreign workers. Uh, and they began the process four months before they needed them, and they are, they've been in, um, in the business of accessing temporary foreign workers for quite some time now. Uh, they uh, submitted their application. 
they had 34 that they applied to come, and when they paid for the seats and the plane arrived, nine of those seats were empty. And the reason being there was a, a problem within their home country, which is Mexico, with processing. And, and it was, uh, I think, a, an infrastructure issue of the time and, and uh, a backlog. But what ended up happening was that facility, for one full month, January of this year, they ran at 60% capacity because they could not access the people. Their operation is very close to the major capital city, Charlottetown, the metropolis. And it means they compete with other jobs that are a little more sexy, to use uh, a, a term another senator made reference to earlier. Um, you know, if, if it's a, a low wage, um, a minimum wage job in um, food service or something that's easier. Um, their HR manager told me this week that he, in the last two weeks, hired 11 domestic people. Yeah. And of the 11, um, six were still there two weeks after the fact. Wow. So the it's very difficult when you hire a marketing team, yeah. uh, you, you plan all of the crops that you're going to plant, you buy and build your storage, you every, all the ducks you need to have in a row to get product out the door, you secure your markets, and if someone doesn't show up to put that potato in that bag, you're not going to be shipping that product to market. <coughs> okay, yeah. very quick response. If I could we're just add, time. workers have expenses too. And it's not uncommon for workers, uh, we mentioned Mexico, um, to actually pay um, um, recruiters who are less than scrupulous upwards of $5,000, which is a, a, a huge sum of money for somebody who comes to Canada as a migrant worker. And then they are indebted to those recruiters who often have um, um, shady uh, positions in the, in, their, in the communities back home. So... In, in addition to employers, it's important to remember that workers have enormous costs coming over with this program as well, which contributes to their vulnerability when they get here, because you've got to pay that back. So, you know, the worker comes back every year, you know, the seasonal worker. And do you face any difficulty, you know, with the help of immigration giving you problem of not being come back on time because your business plan, as you say, you know, you invested more expecting next year, sales increase and all this. Can you comment on that? Yes, and, and something looking forward that I think has people nervous is the requirement for the biometrics and how much that's going to hold up the process mm -hmm. because within these developing countries, they may not have the infrastructure necessary to support workers that need to satisfy biometric requirements of our government. Okay, uh, Senator O, we need to move on. The uh, next uh, questioner is Senator Dogenet. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. My first question is for Ms. Robinson. You talked about the countries where these workers come from, and they seem to come from many different countries. Wouldn't it be better for Canada to search for workers in a limited number of countries in order to help them integrate and help with finding them? And do employers have more success with some groups um, for the jobs that are available? I believe a lot of this has been grandfathered in, that different countries are accessed for different skills. Um, I believe that my, um, my partner, Portia, would be better at answering this question, if you don't mind. I could defer to her. Thank you. So uh, worker integration. Um, Yeah, so worker integration typically um, that for those who are here for seasonal work, so the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, they're just here for uh, the season, eight months of a year, and are looking to return back to their home country. So those workers aren't necessarily interested in immigrating to Canada for the most part. For those that are, the challenge is that there are limited pathways to permanency for the um, that integration, that component. 
um, and that's that's a challenge, and that's clear in the research that there there is more work that needs to be done. The those that the, there are a limited number of countries that participate in the seasonal agricultural worker program, and that is based on bilateral agreements between our country, Canada, and those other countries, and contracts are negotiated with those countries specifically. My second question, Madam Chair, will be for Mr. Johnstone. Sir, you talked about uh, mistreatment and the exploitation of t foreign workers. Can you give us some examples of this mistreatment and whether there have been complaints to put an end to that kind of behavior? Thank you, Senator. Actually, we just had a case um, um, down in southwestern Ontario where there was a group of um, Honduran uh, temporary foreign workers. Um, there were, I believe, there were, there were about eight of them in total who were working at the same facility. And um, again, it was a situation at, like with all of the, the workers in the temporary foreign workers program, where it's where it's a closed permit, so they can only work for a single employer. Um, as I stated earlier, these workers, especially in uh, Honduras or Guatemala, one or the other, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, Rights, uh, especially labor rights, are not um, exactly um, are not as strong there as they are here in other industrialized countries. So, uh, the notion of these workers uh, speaking up uh, at this workplace, which was which was very abusive, was was not an option for them. So they did what so many workers do: is that um, they went underground, and they were picked up by somebody who was. Um, from a similar community but had uh, established residency in Canada and he basically started shopping them around on the on the black labor market selling them to the highest bidder um, they came to our center in in Leamington Ontario where we've had bricks and mortar for 20 years to help these workers advised us of the situation we went to the uh, the federal government the uh, ministry responsible for the program advised them and the evidence was so compelling that uh, two of these workers were immediately de declared as victims of human trafficking. This is, this is a decision by the federal government. And the other, the other workers that were part of the group or cases are being reviewed right now. So this is something that happened in the last two months that was covered by the mainstream media in southwestern Ontario. But it's one instance. We have 30 years of um, cases where um, workers, anything from poor housing conditions, up to health and safety uh, issues, agriculture remains one of the most dangerous country or industries in the country, right up there with mining and construction. Yet again, they do not have anywhere near the same rights as, as folks who work in those other sectors. A couple of years ago, we had a worker who drowned in a vat of manure. I can't think of a more undignified way to die as a worker do you, we think for a second that he had come he was comfortable in exercising his right to refuse not at all and this was the outcome these are the issues that we hear on a regular basis and um, that's why we're so grateful for the committee doing this work and hopefully um, will contribute to the uh, review of the temporary foreign workers program where training at the very least is so desperately needed Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson and Madam Chair. I wanted to ask questions, so I'm sorry, folks. I'll limit you to one each, but I'll make it up in the next panel, okay? Uh, Senator Black. I only have one question. Thanks very much. Where are the application delays? We've heard it from you. We've heard it from others. I've heard it individually uh, visiting farms and, and primary producers. Where are the application delays in the system? Um, it's a it's a tricky question to answer, and you've probably heard different answers from different people. Um, part of the problem is that there are a whole dump number of different departments responsible for and have their hands in the temporary foreign worker program. So there are components that ESTC governs, Service Canada governs, CBSA governs, and the IRCC immigration governs. 
um, along with concerns by Ag Canada. So you now have five departments who are trying to work together to ensure that the program applications move through the system in an appropriate way. And there can be delays um, on from other countries as well. You've answered my question. Okay. Thank you. And we do know that uh, there are different streams. Like in, in the IT business, they have a fast track system where you can get your your worker within two two weeks, ten days. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Senator Gagne. What would be the um, most important change that you would recommend? Uh, uh, changes to the um, the temporary workers uh, program. Consistency and clarity so that everyone knows what the rules are. I, I believe that um, agricultural producers want to abide by the rules. Uh, and we know that uh, they want more workers. And, and um, we all know that if we don't treat our workers right, we won't have our workers. So I'd say uh, consistency and transparency. Transparency. Very quickly, I think... Uh, the provincial nominee program or something like it needs to be expanded. I think we need to shift from an open or a close to an open permit system. And I think above all that training, compulsory training, um, at the very least on health and safety and basic human rights should be a requisite part of this program for all, for all workers engaged in this program and employers too, perhaps. Did you have anything to add? Um, nope. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. That's it? Okay. Thank you. Senator Doyle. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, how do we compare uh, in Canada with jurisdictions uh, around the world, like uh, the U.S., uh, France, uh, Britain? How do we compare in our treatment of temporary foreign workers? Do they have better, more up-to-date programs uh, in how they monitor and treat the temporary foreign worker and do we here in Canada does the federal government have any kind of a monitoring program um, in how they how they check mark off the what temporary foreign workers are how they're being treated it's a good question um, it's important that Canada takes a look outward at what other countries are doing um, all, all countries are facing labor shortages, the developed countries, and uh, the, the world's uh, workforce is it's being globalized. So we are competing for our international workers with other countries. Be, so we need to be aware of that and be careful around that. The United States certainly is... Um, sorting out its own temporary foreign worker program and hoping to streamline it, make it more uh, efficient for employers to access foreign workers. Yeah. And um, we compete for the same foreign workers. The Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, Canada's um, SOP program, is held up as a, a standard, a gold standard um, for um, labor mobility, uh, benefits that extend to Canadian farmers but also to the workers and their families at home and it is a model that others look to so others look to us so um, there is some give and take there thank you well, I think we would disagree on the gold standard but um, in terms of policing I know there are approximately 180 inspectors employed by the federal government for all of Canada, for every province, in excess of 10,000, I think, different employers using this program. So you just look at the math, and there's no way possible that the program can be properly uh, policed with the uh, resources that are allocated there. The truth is, government, um, and it's not surprising that to police this would take tremendous resources, is, is not very good at policing the system. And it doesn't have to be government. We have a long history of, of other sectors where the private sector, employers, and unions have done a pretty good job of uh, setting standards in the sector. And our, our, our position is, is simple. It should apply to the primary agriculture sector as well. Thank you. Thank you. 
one quick question to which I hope I'll get an equally quick answer. Uh, this is for the Canadian Agriculture Resources Council. How common is the irresponsible employer? You know, I've mentioned in my introduction that we've got hundreds of thousands of workers that have come through the system. How common is the irresponsible employer? Do you know? Or do I? We do know cer with certainty that uh, I've got a, a paragraph prepared for you, Senator Griffin. Farmers want to do the right thing. If a grower breaks the rules, a temporary farm worker program fines or bans the employer from the program. Done. Out of the 